The New Jersey Bank Marketing Association presents its October 2011 Bank Marketing Seminar. This program was recorded October 6, 2011 in Clark, New Jersey. I'm your host, Steve Lubetkin. In this program, a presentation by Rich Wiseman, president of DMA. Let's go to the lectern where Dennis Kane of Amboy Bank will introduce the program. Thank you everybody for coming today. Um, our meetings over the last couple of meetings have just been phenomenal. And um, as you know, our last meeting, if any of you tried to sign up and weren't able to attend, I'd like to apologize for us, but um, we never had any, we never thought that we would um, have so many people respond. I think we had 90 people at the last meeting. We did not have this room, and we had a room that would hold 50. We took the tables away, we put chairs in, we did everything we could, but we couldn't accommodate everyone. And I think we had about 30 or 40 people that wanted to attend that we didn't have room for. So for future meetings, um, you may want to sign up early. No, I think we're good now. We have this room for a while. Um, Today's meeting is going to be another phenomenal meeting, um, and I'd like to thank our speakers, many who have traveled around the country to come here today. Um, our meetings keep getting better, our speakers keep getting better, um, and uh, our next meeting is going to be on December 1st. It's our annual forecast meeting. Uh, we have Tom Bracken, who is a former bank president, and also now he's the president of the State Chamber of Commerce. Um, he'll be a speaker. Norm Beatty, who is the president of First Hope Bank, is also on the National uh, Committee for the American Bankers Association. He'll be speaking, and we also have someone to talk about um, shareholder relations, which would be is getting very interesting the way bank stocks are going today. Um, for next year, we, um, we will have a, a board committee meeting after the meeting today. Um, you can tell our board members, because they have a different kind of a name badge, we're really looking for suggestions for topics. So if there's any topic that you're really interested in, you think we should cover, or some great speakers that you may have recently heard, just let any committee member know, because we'll be planning next year um, pretty soon. One of the things we also do in um, New Jersey Bank Marketing Association, we don't have members. Uh, we're part of the Penger Dell Bank Marketing Association. We don't require memberships or anything. Our sole purpose is really to hold meetings like this and provide networking. One of the other things we do is we try and um, informally uh, connect people for jobs. Um, so if people have a job and they're looking for someone, if you let us know, any committee member, we just simply informally get it out on the network. Um, and if you're looking for a job, uh, the same way. Um, an example would be at Amboy Bank, uh, we're now looking uh, for a manager for the call center. And as I was driving to the meeting today, I heard one of Alley Bank's um, commercials, and they were talking about um, banks. And they were talking about banks and said, you know, if you, um, you want to go for just for 9 to 5, uh, sorry, the bank is closed after 5 o'clock, we can't do this, we don't have anybody to re answer your phones, contact them because they're open 24-7. So what I'd like to do is ask Captain, one of our speakers, since you have a great call center 24-7, I'm sure you have a lot of really phenomenal call center people that are probably working the night shift, that's a manager on a night shift that probably doesn't want to work the night anymore. Why don't you have them give me a call? And we have a good, you know, nine to five, you know, just six days a week call center. So we'd be more than happy to uh, make their life a little more livable. That'd be great. Okay, good. Um, okay, uh, that's the commercials for today. Um, what I'd like to do is introduce Darren Cafano from Columbia Bank, who is part of the program committee today, and he's going to take over and introduce the speakers. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, first speaker, Rich Weissman. Rich Weissman is president and CEO of DMA, a premier database provider to banks and credit unions throughout the U.S. and Canada, headquartered in Portland, Oregon. He also heads the DMA Institute Think Tank, which is DMA's industry research arm focused on providing the industry with cutting-edge concepts. Rich has over 25 years of marketing experience in national and international companies. Prior to founding DMA in 1996, Rich was marketing director at Bank of America, U.S. Bank Corp., 
and National Westminster Bank USA, as well as working in market research in the packaged goods industry. His work has been recognized internationally, and he is known as one of the nation's experts in the area of profitability integration for management, finance, marketing, and sales, and he is a top-tier speaker at many financial services industry conferences. Rich completed his PhD work at New York University in quantitative analysis and statistics, and he holds his master's degrees in both science, sociology and psychology, coupled with postgraduate studies at New York University School of Business. He also completed the marketing management program at Stanford University. Rich holds many academic awards, including Phi Beta Kappa, and he completed his BA summa cum laude at New York University in social sciences focused on statistical research. Rich? Thank you. Thank you, and delighted to be here today. Uh, back in the New York area, my goodness, I never turned down an opportunity to come to this part of the world. Uh, actually, yesterday I was, I was in the city, had some meetings, and then I went and visited the apartment I lived at when I was at NYU, and I realized that was getting almost 40 years ago when I lived there, and boy, did I feel old. Glad to be here today. I am from Portland, Oregon now. I've been living in Portland, Oregon for many years now went out there to become uh, marketing director at U.S. Bank Corps when at that time they were headquartered in Oregon and have been on the West Coast um, ever since. Worked for Bank of America when they were located in San Francisco. Uh, now, of course, uh, closer to you, uh, a different Bank of America. I worked with the original Bank of America and delighted to be here, delighted to be here today. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. What, what we're going to talk about today is the impact of customer profitability in managing marketing and sales uh, in today's environment. This clearly is an environment where the world is changing, is changing rapidly, and we believe at DMA that customer profitability is going to be a key in how we go about uh, managing going forward. Lots of ways in which you can measure customer profitability. We're going to talk about why it's important to get it right and how one goes about getting it right. Just to give you a slide on who we are, because many of you do not know who DMA is, we were started in 1996. Our job is to work specifically with community banks, thrifts, and credit unions. Not the big boys, the Bank of America, or U.S. Bank Corps, but folks who otherwise would not have available to them the kind of sophisticated technologies that we're going to talk about today. So we came into being to provide community banks with that kind of technology, with the resource, we become their fully outsourced provider who, do, who does all this work for them uh, to help institutions like yourselves really raise the level of sophistication in terms of thinking, in terms of activities, and certainly in terms of understanding the numbers. Uh, we do it through what's called a, a inferential cognition system. That's a system that connects all the dots and really provides artificial intelligence in very new kinds of ways. And we do three things. Uh, one, we have our IDM, Integrated Database Marketing System. It brings together customer data. It brings together general ledger. It brings together external data. The purpose of which is to focus on the income statement and on capital. And that's truly what we're about. How do we make sure that our income statement is front and center and that all marketing and sales activities <coughs> are focused on the income statement in a very serious way. We do lots of research and analysis. As you heard, I'm a statistician by training, so I like to hire people who have backgrounds in those kinds of areas. And we do lots of modeling technologies to really begin to understand our markets, our products, our customers, in altogether different and very detailed kinds of ways. And we have created a think tank, so we devote lots of energies, lots of resource to just studying the market, studying the industry, <clears throat> and then bringing new ideas, fresh ideas, new concepts uh, to the markets. And that's what brings me here uh, today. We're always delighted at the opportunities to talk about some of these concepts with, uh, with folks like yourselves. Um, the goal is to integrate, integrate across marketing, sales, finance, and management. So often at institutions, those operate as independent silos. And our goal is to bring that together in a very meaningful way. Go to our website, lots of articles, lots of white papers. You can go to Wikipedia and look us up, and you'll see all the different kinds of things that we've written about and talked about. And we've won lots and lots of different awards. And again, you can go to our website and see what those are relative to really understanding how is our industry changing 
and how do we as marketing and salespeople behave very differently um, as we go forward. Okay, what do we want to talk about today? Three things. One, I want to give you an understanding today of why customer profitability is so important. Now, we all know it's important, but I want you to understand why it's critical and why getting it right is truly critical to how you run your marketing and sales functions. I want to look at the different components and methodologies, ways in which you can do that. And I want to identify for you some ways to begin to utilize that in a meaningful way, in a serious way, in how you go to market, how you sell, how you develop product. We in our industry don't typically do a good job at that. We're going to talk about that. Today I'm hoping you can begin to see a new path uh, for that. And what are the takeaways? What are the things I'm hoping that we walk away with this morning? One is to understand that it's dangerous, and I use that word carefully, dangerous to manage without serious customer profitability measurements. I'm hoping today we have a roadmap for how you go about doing that right. And I want you to see that there are ways for banks that are small, banks that are big. This isn't just for the big boys anymore. All of us, every one of us, can truly begin to get serious about customer profitability uh, in ways we haven't before. I want to touch on some strategies, kind of give you at the end a little checklist of some of the strategies that you need to begin to think about and adopt. And all of this is based on our mantra. If you come out to Portland, Oregon, um, and to Beaverton, which is a suburb of Portland, and um, you walk into our main lobby, you're going to see in big letters our mantra, and walk down our corridors, and everywhere you go, there it is. You can't miss it. And for us, it's fundamental to what the future of banking looks like. And it's very simple. Only the most informed and profitable will survive and prosper. It is about detailed information that focuses on profitability that will make the difference between what banks are here in 10 years, which ones aren't, who's successful, and who isn't. Only the most informed and profitable will survive and prosper. And we're going to talk today a little bit about what we mean by profitability. Because profitability has lots of different meanings to folks. And I want to make sure that we're clear when we use that term. What does that mean? So kind of put that in the back of your mind. We're going to touch on that a little later. Well, this has been quite the ride in our industry the past few years, huh? If I had told you five years ago that, oh, Indy Mac and WAMU, they won't be around anymore, and we're going to see Fannie and Freddie in trouble, and FDIC is going to be assessing you because they're kind of running out of money, and Wachovia, well, that name will go away, Countrywide, Lehman and Merrill, and lots and lots of regional and community banks will disappear. You would have thought perhaps I was nuts. I remember meeting with, talking with the folks at IndyMac, the folks at WAMU, about five years ago, pre the crisis, and telling them that it looked to us like they would be out of business. And they couldn't see it. They were smart people, educated, bright people, but they could not see what was unfolding. They couldn't see what was in front of them. Now, we couldn't predict the credit crisis, but we saw other things as we looked at those institutions and saw other things that were happening in our industry. We saw a bubble that was about to burst, and most of us couldn't see it happening. We didn't have the tools, the measurement, the concepts to understand what was unfolding. And these meltdowns, they were inevitable. They were going to happen. And today we're going to understand why it was inevitable and how we all ensure that that doesn't happen again. Because look at where we are today. These are the number of failed institutions by year. My goodness. And you know, we still have almost a thousand institutions nationwide that are classified as troubled. So we're not out of the woods yet. We are in an environment that is unlike, unlike an environment that we've been in, truly generational. And if you think about those institutions, think about the names I had on that board. They all thought they were well capitalized and profitable, didn't they? Talked with Wamu. They thought they were doing great. 
Their bottom line looked wonderful. Folks at Indy Mac, they were growing. Each month they were making more and more money. They all thought they were doing the right things. Certainly the regulators, and I do talk with regulators now, they've become incredibly interested in what we do suddenly. And I asked them, where the heck were you guys? Where were you? What were you measuring? Because the regulators looked at all these institutions that failed and said, doing good. They all thought they had risk strategies in place. Not one of those institutions on that board would have thought that it did not have quality risk strategies. And they all thought that as marketers, they were going to market in the right ways. They were managing customers in the right ways. Not one of those institutions woke up in the morning and said, let's screw up. They thought they were doing things right, but they failed. And now we have a thousand institutions classified as troubled. And I think, I think all of us have a fundamental question that we have to ask ourselves. How did this happen? Because look what it's created for you. You have pressures on your income statement, on your income, in ways that you haven't had before. Significant pressures, because you've lost capital, and your loan losses are up, and your reserves are up, and you've had assessments, and you really continue to be concerned about things like FDIC. Your boards are breathing down your back, and the market's pulling back. And those have such pressure on the income statement. And then, of course, the government steps in. And what does the government do? It puts more pressure on us. Now, we work closely with the uh, uh, economics division in the ABA in Washington with their chief economist and help to prepare uh, the uh, package that went to Congress uh, over a year ago before they voted on FINREG, and then the package that went to Congress more recently, uh, earlier this year, that uh, went to Congress prior to the vote on the Durbin Amendment. We weren't successful, obviously, in that regard, but I think we did help to clarify the issues involved in these financial regulations and how they will hurt our industry and hurt it big time. These are serious, serious new regulations that have significant impacts. And even something like the Durbin Amendment, which many of us in this room think we're immune to because we're too small, none of us, none of us is immune to that. And we have all these pressures all these serious pressures in an environment that truly we haven't seen before. And we do owe it to ourselves to ask a fundamental question. What did we miss? What did we individually, at our banks, and as an industry, miss? How could we have not seen this? Well, let's take a look back. <laughs> We at DMA think the world consists of three distinct phases when it comes to the world of banking, truly since the Great Depression of the 1930s. If you go back over that period and divide it into three cultures, this is what it looks like. The first we call the banking culture, and that was pre-1980. And as in my bio you said I've been in the industry for 25 plus years, I never define what the plus is because I can remember being in this industry in 1980. And the goal of the pre-1980 culture was open up branches, be where our customers are located, service them, take them out to golf, maybe give some toasters every now and then. Remember those days for those of you in this room who are old enough. And wait for growth. We didn't compete. We didn't market. We didn't sell. Those were not part of our vernacular back then in this particular era. Because we were so regulated, the government basically told us what to offer, how to price, and our margins were set by government fiat. That changed and changed in 1980 with an act of Congress. And I can remember it was the Depository Institution Deregulation Committee deregulated our industry and suddenly we all got on this bandwagon we call the sales culture. And I won't embarrass you, but I'm sure if I asked you to raise your hand, how many of you for the past 25 years have been so heavily focused on selling and developing a sales culture. We all got on that bandwagon because the goal here was let's drive growth, not wait for it, and let's do it by selling and cross-selling and pump up that balance sheet and sell for volumes. Measure ourselves based on how many customers did we bring in and what our cross-sell is and how big our balance sheet is. 
And that was the driver, fair enough to say, of our industry and remains the driver of our industry for the vast majority of institutions today. Well, we've, for the past 15 years, been talking about the need to enter a new culture called the profitability analytic culture. And it is where, you, sure, you've got to grow, and sure, you've got to market and sell, but it has to be about profitability. You don't just sell to get a lot. You've got to have profitable growth of pro by upselling profitable products to profitable customers in profitable ways. It's about the income statement and the analytics behind that income statement. We classify all banks according to three strategic positions, and it's, 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 it's fun to go through that exercise and to look at institutions and to classify them according to one of these three. And we do believe that the world can be divided into these three strategic positions for banks, and each one defines its philosophy, how it does business, and ultimately becomes a predictor for growth or decline. The first we call the lost. You know folks like that. Uh, they believe the good times are just around the corner. Sit tight. Don't do anything. Okay? Don't work hard. Create those independent silos. Marketing does its things. Sales its things. Finance. Management. They don't know their numbers and they really don't care to know. The bottom line's good enough. These are the folks, obviously, who are going to languish, go away. Fortunately, today, most banks don't fall into this category. We do find that this is becoming an increasingly small group. But there still are folks who truly are out there, and they're lost. This presentation is not geared towards those folks. The second group, which is the largest group of banks in this country and Canada, we also serve uh, Canadian banks as well, uh, Canadian institutions as well. We call the wave runners. Those are the folks, and they truly define 80 plus percent of all banks out there, who believe that our outcomes, our results, are dependent upon the economic cycle in which we find ourselves. Times are good, we do good. Times aren't so good, we don't do so good. That truly we ride the waves over time. We do lots of things. We focus on lots of hot trends, what's ever made that front page of that industry pub, kind of silver bullet product or market or idea at the moment. We know our numbers, but kind of superficially, and it's good enough, we think. These are the folks that define most institutions, and that's why most institutions continue to struggle, waiting for the environment to get better, hoping that a new wave will come along that we all can, can ride. And this defines most of our industry. Now we think there is a third strategic position. And we're starting to see an emerging group there. Certainly we're helping to push folks into that, into that category, which we call the innovator. And those are folks who are challenging that concept that we have to be wave dependent. Those are the folks who understand there are lots of incremental steps you can achieve, an ongoing strategy, wave independent if you focus on profitability and you understand it in an incredibly detailed way. Deep understanding of your numbers, deep understanding of the dynamics behind it. These are the folks who are going to, to lead the industry. And if we correlate those three uh, 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 cultures with those three positions, we see a very clear connection between those who are lost and the banking hours culture those who are in the sales culture, those are the wave runners, and those who are the innovators who are in the profitability culture. Because we're no longer prepared to say, just everybody knows better than we, so just kind of follow. Follow the market. If they charge X, we'll charge X plus Y or X minus Y. They're not just going to manage based on external environment and feel like we're victims and just sell to the balance sheet. They're folks who are going to be smarter, smarter. And that's what I challenge you today, is how do we become smarter about what we do so we no longer have to be dependent and praying for the next positive wave? That's what customer profitability is about. So as a foundation for talking about that, we've got to move from being wave runners into innovators. Because the wave runners are where most folks are today. And wave runners typically measure 
three things. And if these are the three things that truly define your key measures for marketing and sales activity, then you are clearly right smack in the wave runner culture. Sales volumes, how many accounts did I open? How many new customers did I gain? Cross sell, has my cross sell, the average number of products I sell to each customer gone up? And is my balance sheet growing? Am I seeing more loans on the books? Am I increasing deposits? These are the three measures that wave runners, sales culture folk, guilty as charged, focus on, because most institutions do this. And what it does is it engenders this culture of just sell lots of stuff. Just sell lots. Mass marketing, silver bullet product. And we look at customers relative to how we grow the balance sheet. And the question is, and if you think about that, how does that correlate Now imagine I've gone into your institution, gotten all kinds of data from every customer uh, account that you have, and gone into the general ledger, and brought in external data, and created a unique income statement for every account that every customer has. Just imagine that I've done that for the moment. We'll talk in a moment about how you have to do that. But imagine I've done that, and I've taken every customer, and I've ranked them from the most unprofitable to the most profitable based on their unique income statements per account. Imagine that. If I did, this is what you would look like. Why? Because this is standard in our industry. And whether you're a big bank or a small bank, the pattern is the same. This institution has 28,000 customer relationships. It earns $2.2 million on an annualized basis which means on average each customer generates $79. Not bad. Cross-sell 1.94. Not so good. So what should this institution do? Well, phase two would say just sell more. But let's look at this. Because I've, I've taken every customer from the most unprofitable all the way up to the most profitable. I've put them in 10% groups. Simple chart, simple analysis here. And I've looked at what their contribution to the bottom line is. Look at that top group. It generates $10.6 million. That's 478% of all earnings. Almost 500% of all earnings come from the top 10%. How many of you think that's a healthy distribution? How many of you would take all of the money that you've saved your entire lives in your savings account, in your investment account, in your 401k, and invest in a single stock? Not one hand in this room, right? Because you have to have a diversified portfolio. How diversified are you when it comes to your own bank and your income statement? We've seen numbers that go 400, 500, 600. We just set up a client. Their first run, 1,000%. That top group generates 10 times what the institution makes. You think this is healthy? Not at all. This is a formula for failure. And look how it quickly drops. This group makes 600,000. Now we're negative. Bottom group loses almost twice what the institution makes. But look at the correlation, you don't have to be a statistician to figure this out, between profitability and cross-sell. My goodness, my highest profitability is amongst my highest cross-sell. And in fact, it follows this very interesting U-shaped curve, standard in our industry, standard, which is those that are incredibly unprofitable have incredibly high cross-sell. Those that are incredibly profitable, that's that 500% group, have moderate cross-sell. And then lots of people at the bottom with minimal cross-sell. What happens when I just target for cross-sell here? I am more likely to move people in this direction than this direction. And by gosh, 25 years of just cross-selling did just that. We noticed year in, year out, this got steeper and steeper and steeper. A bubble, and that's what this is, a bubble waiting to burst. Because each year we became more and more dependent on that small group up there to generate more and more income to make up for all the losses at the other end. Let's bust up that top 10%. Remember that group that generated almost 500% of all earnings, 10.6 million for the institution that makes 2.2? Look at the top 1%. 
generates over six million. That's almost 300% of all earnings come from 1% of your customer base. And that's true for the vast, vast majority of you in this room. That is a formula for failure. Let's look at it by product. Let's take all those income statements we have for every account, for every customer, and now let's uh, add them up by product. Let's slice by product. Look at this. Now, your products may look different than this. Every institution is different. But the pattern is the same insofar as, look at this, two products that generate over 250% of all earnings. Most products, highly unprofitable. Highly unprofitable. Can you imagine other industries that would allow most of its products to be unprofitable? Look at it by markets. Here I'm looking on the retail side. I'm looking by generation. Look at this. The great generation generating $7.3 billion. This institution loses money on everyone else. Is that a formula for success? Not hardly. We do lots of presentations and we've done lots of research on Gen X, Gen Y, and everyone concludes you can't make money from them. The answer to that is wrong. We have to restructure this. We have to find ways that we're not dependent on one market. Or how about branches? Start looking at this by branch. Look at this. Two branches generating over 150% of all earnings. And most branches, negative in profitability. How long do you think Target would allow itself to stay in business where most of its stores are unprofitable? Come the end of the day, all they do is lose money. And yet we do in our industry. We allow two branches to generate 150% of all earnings. How about by sales officer? How about an income statement by sales officer? And let's look at each sales officer and the income that they are responsible for. Look at this. Two officers, well, Leanna and Charles, the names have been changed, by the way, to protect the innocent, generate over 160% of all earnings. And most officers, negative. And many not even paying their salaries. These concentrations of earnings in a handful of customers and products and markets and branches and officers is incredibly unhealthy and is a bubble waiting to burst. Because we have to deal with some real, real hard realities in our industry and we need to wake up relative to those. Because we spent years doing this, years of cross-selling, years of customer acquisition that did this. We worked hard at it, put a lot of capital, a lot of expenses, a lot of marketing effort into making all this happen. That group at the bottom that loses us two times what the institution makes and has the highest cross-sell, we worked really hard at that. That didn't just happen. And we noticed that year in, year out, things got worse and worse and worse, waiting for something to happen. So we kind of missed it. Because the hard reality that all of us have to ultimately deal with, and this was the bubble we created, the balloon. It took the credit crisis, acted as the pin that broke it. But by gosh, that balloon was going to burst anyway. Because the reality is, most of what we do is unprofitable. And that's no way to run a railroad. Where most of what you do day in, day out, isn't profitable. So now we've got to start to understand profitability in new ways, in detailed ways. And we have to understand that profitability equals sustainability. I tell folks, profitability, it's not about greed. It's not about squeezing every nickel you can out of every customer. It's about ensuring that your income statement is sustainable. It can sustain itself over periods of time and different economic and other kinds of cycles. And you have to think profitability equals sustainability. Doesn't mean you're necessarily going to make more money, although when folks manage for profitability, they do wind up doing that. But the goal is to have an income statement that's sustainable. Because the meltdowns were, weighted, were, were lurking there. And if people had paid attention, we might have seen it coming. But boy, everybody was just looking at other things and just looking at that bottom line and feeling good. And the industry missed it. 
And we as marketers, as marketing people, fundamentally, we didn't attend to business. We really didn't. We allowed this to happen with our sales culture, our sales-driven way of doing business. So how do we innovate? Well, let's look at outside of our industry. I like to look outside of our industry. I was in the packaged goods industry before I started my career in banking a billion years ago and worked on the introduction of the first in-home pregnancy test when that was a brand new concept to see if American women would actually take something home and trust the results. Work with Quaker on the introduction of the granola bar when the concept of eating healthy was a brand new idea and would Americans really buy a snack food that was called healthy? I worked with Scott Paper on the introduction of Emboss, now called quilted toilet paper, and determined whether or not Americans would pay more to have their paper, their toilet paper quilted. And the answer is yes, and it's been very successful. And worked on the introduction, although it didn't look like this, of the first kind of cell phones that were out there to see. Would people take their phones and walk around with them? The reason why I mention that is these are great industries to look at. Because what I learned from those industries, they understand every piece of the profitability equation at Quaker. They know exactly what that raisin costs, and what that piece of chocolate costs, and what that granola piece costs, what that piece of oat costs. They understand every piece of the cost equation, every piece of the revenue equation, understand the value of each and every sale. The same is true for these others. I go to banking, go to work for NatWest USA at the time, S to see where are my customer profitability reports, my product profitability reports, my market profitability, my branch profitability. They say, well, we don't track things that way in our industry. We look at the bottom line. If the number's good, good to go. And that's the problem we've had in our industry. So let's go, let's move into this new phase where we understand that the concentration of the income statements can tell us whether or not we will sustain ourselves over periods of time, and we've done a lot of statistical analysis to demonstrate that when those concentrations are minimized, income is sustained. It's about understanding and managing for customer profitability as a fundamental, fundamental marketing and sales concept. Profit risk, what is this? This term that we came up with many years ago and the, the ABA, by the way, calls us the profit profit um, because of this concept of profit risk. The ability to prophesize what your future looks like by understanding the concentration of your income statement versus whether or not it is distributed, diversified, and whether you have quality and different profit streams that can sustain different periods of cycles. It's part of, of risk management, and it's core to phase three. And we have to start to understand that. None of you would run your bank without credit risk. Well, I, I hope so, right? Okay. None of you would run your bank without asset liability uh, risk management, would you? Of course not. You have people who do this. Who has a profit risk manager in their bank? Who has someone who's responsible for managing profit risk? Well, you, you, you look at the balance sheet, but where's the income statement? How come you forgot to manage for that? Because when we manage for that, we make sure that our institution is viable long term and can sustain itself. So how, how are we going to do that? Let me give you an example. Okay? I want you to imagine that there are two customers at your bank. Okay? There's me and John. And we both keep $2,000 in our interest checking account. Are we equal in profitability? $2,000, exact same product at your bank. Well, I write 40 checks a month, John writes 10. I make 12 deposits a month, John makes two. Um, by the way, I make all my deposits at the teller. John hasn't been to a teller in years. Um, I'm a very heavy ATM user, but always on us. Won't pay a foreign ATM fee, just generate costs, no revenue. John uses foreign machines, doesn't cost us anything, and we get some nice little spiff back <coughs> in the form of foreign ATM fee income. I never use my debit card in a point of sale environment, generates zero interchange. John's a heavy POS user, generates some quality interchange income for us. Um, there's a monthly fee of $5. I went in and got it waived because I'm such a good customer because I'm always in the branch. John pays his $5 a month. 
the interest rate on this particular account is supposed to be 0.2 at this tier. I went in and complained they bumped it up to 0.8. You get the idea. Same product, same balance, altogether different profitability. We need to understand that and we need to create an income statement for John's account that is different from my account that reflects this and every other piece of, of the profitability equation. Secondly, let's say John and I both have $40,000 at your bank. We both have a checking account and a money market account. Sounds good. And we both open up a, a high rate CD this month. Very nice. Someone gets an award for that. And we end the month at 50000 so we both brought in $10,000 to the bank, right? Excellent. Just one problem. My CD that I opened up is 30000 John's CD that he opened up is 1000 I had to move $15,000 from my checking account to fund that CD. John added $4,000 to his checking account. I also moved $5,000 from my money market account. John added $5,000 to his money market account. Come the end of the month, 60% of my balances are now in a high rate CD versus John, it's only 2%. We have to start to understand this. We have to understand profitability, account by account, relationship by relationship. We have to understand cash flows, how money moves around, what's new, what's churned, what goes out, customer relationship by customer relationship, and tie it together and understand how that's impacting our income statement. Now, it's not easy. <laughs> this isn't an easy thing to do. You're not going to pull out a sp an Excel spreadsheet and just kind of whip this out. It requires some serious work. It requires working with a database, a serious database that integrates across every type of account, every type of activity, every transaction of every one of your customers, and that integrates where the general ledger is at the core. Imagine a marketing and sales system in which the GL is at the core. What an idea, huh? Where we're focused on the general ledger, on the income statement at the core. It means understanding every piece of non-interest expense, every piece of non-interest income, and it means understanding the margin through very sophisticated funds transfer pricing. And it means creating complete cash flows within each and every relationship that you serve. It means bringing lots of data together, all the internal, external systems of record on your core and other systems, every piece of the GL and all the details behind it, the transaction files. And it means going externally and bringing in lots of data so we understand who our customers are from a demographic, business graphic uh, perspective. And integrating that in a meaningful way, performing complex profitability and cash flow analysis, and then beginning, beginning to use this in a serious, serious way as we go to market. Now, whether you use our system, the IDM system, or something else, the point is you gotta go into your systems of record and pull in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of data fields and transaction files, millions of pieces of data. You gotta go into your general ledger and understand every detail every line item, every piece of it, and you gotta go externally and bring in lots of external data. You gotta bring that together, integrate, look at things on a customer relationship basis, start to model and truly begin to perform analytics on who's profitable, what's profitable, why, and how do we change those dynamics. For non-interest expense, it means looking at every line item, every piece, every activity, and exploding that general ledger back to the specific account that created that specific expense. If John doesn't go to a teller, he doesn't own one piece of the teller cost. If I went 12 times last month, I have to have my piece of that. It means fully, fully allocating each piece back to the account that created that activity, making sure we roll it back up again, and making sure we're in sync. And here are examples. Lots of things we got to do. Look at loan losses. We have to start to understand loan losses based on which products people buy and what their specific credit scores are, both or, 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 or credit analysis on the commercial side, and start allocating every piece of expense back to those who created it. And we have to do it either on a fully loaded and also on a marginal basis so we can look at things direct and indirect. We have to understand non-interest income, every piece, every fee, 
every fee that every account generated to our non-interest income line items and make sure that we attribute back to those accounts that fee that they specifically created. And when we roll it back up, we got to be in sync. And here are some examples of all the different kinds of fees that we have to account for within every account. And we got to do it not just on assess, but also based on what we collected. You can assess a fee, but you don't always collect it. We got to understand funds transfer pricing. That's critical. And as marketers, we need to get a handle on how we go about creating that spread and understanding the economic value of every deposit and every loan relative to its rate, relative to its balance, and relative to the term. And it has to be unique to you. Your GL is different. Your income statement, what makes your bank profitable, is different than what makes your bank profitable. And you may be profitable customer at Bank X, but not so profitable Bank Y, depending upon its unique, unique income statement structure. No industry averages, no bank averages. You've got to get down to the micro level, and you've got to do it each and every month because profitability is dynamic. And this has to be how you run your marketing and sales activities 24-7. Truly has to become the way in which we do it. Here's an example of an income statement. Look at this. You need to have one of these for every account that every one of your customers has, whether you're a big bank or a small bank. Here's Quincy Roberts. She has a premier checking account. We make $171 from her, $229 on margin. We make $88 on non-interest income, and, we, and it costs us $145. She's unique. No one else looks like this. Here are all the fees that Quincy paid. And look, here are all the expenses she generated based on understanding all the ways in which she transacted, behaved, and full allocation of every expense line item that uniquely belongs to Quincy's account. You need to do this for every account of for every one of your customers. It means understanding every piece. I'm building here a pomegranate. That's what I'm building. It means you got to start by understanding every seed in the pomegranate. You start by understanding each one is different and unique. Then, and only then, can you build up to product market and so forth. And then, and only then, can you balance back to your general ledger. You don't start here and force down. You start here by understanding the uniqueness of every account that every customer has. And when you do that, you can start to measure profit risk. And you can start to see where your concentrations are. And when you're unhealthy, you can start to take some action. And the regulators, by the way, are going to start to ask these kinds of questions. They're becoming terribly interested in this concept. So what are the things you're going to do once you have this kind of information available? Once you can access this, what are you going to do that's different? Well, you're going to move them up. The goal isn't to take those customers at the bottom and tell them to leave. Why? One, you've got a lot of fixed costs. All you're going to do is take those fixed costs and just spread them out amongst others. And two, they're really good customers because they bought a lot from you. That's shame on us, not shame on them that they're unprofitable. We need to move everyone up. We have clients that we specifically work on a move them up strategy. Let's, let's start where only 10% of our base is profitable. Let's set a goal of 20%. Then let's move it to 30%, to 40, to 50. Let's keep going and move everyone up in profitability contribution. Let's start matrix marketing. How many of you have matrix marketing programs? And are they fundamentally based on going after and targeting, micro-targeting folks for activities that when they purchase a product, when they engage in an activity, when they are retained in a particular way, they move up in profitability. We have to start looking at our products and their break-evens and understand thresholds and when it's okay to price a product in a certain way and when it's not. We have to start looking at combination of services. How many of you have a McDonald's, what we call the McDonald's strategy, which is understanding which combinations of products are profitable and which ones aren't? that when certain products come together, like a burger, a Coke, and a fries, it's a profitable sale. When other products come together, it's not. We have to start doing that and packaging based on profitability dynamics. We have to start doing price sensitivity analysis and have analytics to understand each time we price a product, what is its impact to the bottom line. 
and we have to start to target market in very different ways that are focused on profitability analytics. We've got to have a branching strategy. How many of you create an income statement for each market in which each branch resides? To understand the potential profitability that a market defines for you and whether it's worth being in that market or not. And whether you have your fair share of profitability in that market. And you need to include this in your incentive plan. We have folks, I think there's an article in your package on some, who went from an incentive plan that's sales driven to one that's profitability driven. So let's conclude. Lots of meltdowns. We're not done. And we found ourselves in this position, not just because of the credit crisis, but because we didn't understand profitability. We didn't build stratifications for diversification. We truly, truly were so enmeshed in this sales culture that we forgot the income statement. You're all here today. You've survived. <laughs> You're going forward. Let's not repeat this again. Let's get smarter this time around and quickly move into phase three thinking and become innovators. So take a leadership role. That's what I encourage marketing and sales folks to do. I know you went into marketing and sales not to take the finance classes, not to take the accounting classes, but it's about, it's about understanding profitability. And that's how we as marketers and salespeople can be successful. Certainly adopt our mantra. Quick questions and then we're going to break. Questions, comments? Yes, sir. We've seen in the, uh, in, in the media the last few days a, a Bank of America uh, with the $5 fee for uh, check cards. The question is, there's so many opinions of why they did this. And was it a message to the government? Was it a strategy to say we're going to um, unload our unprofitable customers at the bottom end or, um, or what? What, what? What do you think? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Sure. <laughs> um, and actually, I talked about this about a year ago at the Financial Managers Society, which is bank CFOs from throughout the country, and said this is what the big boys are going to do, and it was just that. Start to charge to have a uh, debit card, and they're going to impose a monthly fee on that. So it doesn't surprise me that Bank of America did that. One, it was to send a message to the government, but it was also to send a very clear, clear message to, to themselves and their investors that the Durban Amendment hurts, and we're going to make up for that income. And third, for folks who are not prepared to pay that fee, they can truly do business elsewhere. So it was all of those things that this was about. They did it. They did it big. It wasn't a $1 fee. It wasn't a $2. $5 a month, my goodness huge. And they're not fools at Bank of America. At least they weren't back then. I don't think they are today. They knew just what they were doing. It's a very clear message. And it's a way for them to generate serious income because the loss of interchange income is significant, significant uh, to all banks uh, and particularly to the big boys. Um, so I think it was all three of those things, not just one. They're saying that more banks are not affected by the interchange uh, uh, the, the change. Mm -hmm. um, Ask Visa how they're going to handle the two-tier system. They don't even know. Okay. Nobody knows how this is going to work. And we do know that in other places in which this has been implemented, Durban actually was tailored after the Australian model that happened uh, almost a decade ago. And then the European model, which went after the exact same thing. It was interchange income and taking away interchange income, setting limits. Uh, for banks in terms of what they could charge on interchange. All it did was shift huge amounts of monies from the banks to the retailers. The consumer never saw any value from it. And this is exactly what happened in those nations. If there is a two-tier program, though, the banks theoretically should not be, as, be impacted. In theory, okay. in theory, the banks wouldn't be impacted. Do you really think that the retailers are going to let that happen? Do you really think that they are going to allow different cards to have different pricing structures? Maybe they will short term to get this through. Long term, absolutely not. If you think you're immune to it because you fall under that threshold, that's just not the case. 
This is an issue that affects all of us, whether you're B of A or not. Now, what's fortunate about what B of A did right now is it leaves you opportunity to clearly go after their base. Because there are a lot of really angry uh, customers, B of A customers out there right now, who are asking themselves if they want to change banks. And this might be community banks to kind of make hay while the going's good. Long term, though, you are not immune. And don't kid yourself in thinking that as long as Dodd-Frank remains and as long as the Durbin Amendment remains, you're immune from this, you're not. And it represents, I would venture to say, because if you're like every other bank, the vast majority, the largest fee income producer today is not NSFOD fees, it's interchange fees. And when that starts to erode, that's going to hurt and hurt big time. Other questions? Thank you very much. Delightful to be here today. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the New Jersey Bank Marketing Association. For more information, visit njbankmarketing.com. We produce these programs in the studios of Lubetkin Global Communications in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at lubetkin.net. For everyone at the New Jersey Bank Marketing Association, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for being with us, and we'll see you out there on the net. Take good care.